Hello, hola. Um, I'm so pleased to see all of you in, in this room online. Um, we're celebrating this evening the launch of the agriculture issue of Revista, the winter issue 2024. I still can't believe it's 2024. Um, we'll be having a great panel with people from all over Latin America and California. That counts as Latin America. <laughs> and followed by, for those in the room, a reception. I'm sorry, we have not figured out how to teletransport our receptions. <laughs> um, before we get started, um, a few housekeeping things. Um, this, there will be simultaneous translation. The panelists are going to be talking some in English, some in Spanish. And if you're online, you just look for the little globe down at the bottom of your screen and click that, click that and choose your language. If you're here in the room and you have a cell phone, you can also listen to the, tra the translation on, on Zoom. And Ada, who is sitting here in the green jacket, can help you get on the Zoom if you would like. Um, there will be a question and answer period afterwards. Um, if you're online, the chat has been disabled. Look for where it says Q&A, and you can write in your question in English or in Spanish at any time that you want, but we'll be asking the questions at the end of the panel. Have I done all the housekeeping things? I've done all the housekeeping things. So now we get to the important, wonderful, exciting part, uh, which is to introduce our moderator, who is also a heroine because she is going off of sabbatical for a couple of hours to moderate for us. Gabriela Soto Laviaga is professor of the history of science and the Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico at Harvard University. She is finishing a book on the impact of the Green Revolution in Mexico and in India. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Gabriela. Uh, thank you. So Thank you so much, June. And um, I want to say that it's a little hard to say no to June when she asks you to do things. Um, muy buenas noches. Muy buenas noches a todos. Bienvenidos a la ponencia. This panel will be bilingual. So um, as June said, you can select which language you want. If you need interpretation on the bottom of your screen, you can click that. It is my real pleasure to moderate this panel that launches the latest revista with a focus on agriculture. I've read the panelists' uh, short papers and you're in for a real treat. I want to say just a, a very brief two minutes about why this is important. In the mid 20th century marked the height of both the Cold War and the era of development projects destined to quote, modernize, unquote, Latin America with external formulas for progress. In this context, agriculture, became a singular concern of funding agencies. For many global institutions, the world's population was at a tipping point. As evidence of this problem, many agencies zeroed in on the apparent increase in famis, famines crisscrossing various continents. As organizations such as the World Bank argued, hunger would destabilize an already ideologically divided world. The concern was, with hunger was tied to a Malthusian fear that the world was already overpopulated and incapable of feeding itself. Thus, philanthropic organizations such as the Rockefeller Foundation shifted their focus away from earlier mandates to instead invest in researching agriculture. The clear goal was to apply science to the fields with the aim of producing more food to avoid the specter of hunger. Today, we are living with the aftermath 
of many of those decisions that were taken in the 20th century or early. In some ways, this revista attempts to capture the diversity of topics that agriculture serves as an umbrella for. From acai to quinoa, cashew, cacao, wetlands, we will be, and pesticides, and uh, we will be hearing about some of that in today's panel. We have, um, as I said, a terrific panel, and we will be starting with Pablo La Peña. Uh, uh, Pablo La Peña is an associate professor of sociology and Latin American and Caribbean studies at the University of Georgia. His award-winning book, Soybeans and Power, Genetically Modified Crops, Environmental Politics and Social Movements in Argentina was published in Spanish as La Argentina Transgénica, de la resistencia a la adaptación, una etnografía de las poblaciones campesinas. He is collaborating with Dr. Joanna Kunin on a research project on how farmers reconcile the economic benefits afforded by herbicides and the environmental and health impacts of pesticides. In 2022-23, Pablo was a Peggy Rockefeller visiting scholar at Dr. Class, and I enjoyed many conversations when, with him when he was here. And um, may I just ask the Dr. Class office if you could mute yourselves so that we aren't hearing what's going on there. Okay, thank you so much. Pablo, I pass it on to you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to be back at Dr. Class, even though uh, being virtual, you know, through Zoom. Uh, so let me jump right to it and start uh, unpacking by unpacking the the title of uh, my presentation on the article that we wrote with uh, Dr. Kunin. Um, so um, you know, when when we talk about soybeans, and I'll be I'll be speaking about GM or genetically modified soybeans. Uh, I'm referring to uh, for those uh, who doesn't know. Uh, about genetically modified soybeans that being engineered to resist an herbicide that help farmers to eliminate weed. So uh, farmers can spray an herbicide on soybean plantations to kill the weeds, but because of the gene that soybeans have, the herbicides don't kill the, the soybean plants. And um, we say, uh, we use this term Argentina and beyond because, um, Argentina and Latin America plays a big role in the world of genetically modified crops. Here you can see the global area with GM crops. And um, as you can see in the graph at a glimpse, uh, Brazil and Argentina and other Latin American countries uh, represent a high percentage of GM crops, uh, around 79 million hectares. For those of you who are in Massachusetts, that's 29 times the area of the state of Massachusetts for reference. And uh, what this graph doesn't capture is the role that Argentina played in the expansion of GM crops, and uh, particularly soybeans in South America. And that's why we put this in our article with Joanna, we put this image of the United Republic of Soybeans. This was a advertisement that a global biotech company published in 2003 in an Argentine national newspaper. And at the time, GM soybeans were only legal to be planted in Argentina and Uruguay. So this map showing Brazil, Paraguay, and Bolivia uh, was premonitory in a way. And it captures um, the expansion from Argentina to the rest of the continent. And some of the impacts that this expansion had can be seen in a couple of graphs that I'm going to show you. First one, uh, this is the... Uh, top 10 countries in herbicide use around the world and Argentina and Brazil occupy number two and number three in terms of herbicide use around the world. And that has to do with this, what Charles Benbrook says in this quote, that globally glyphosate, which is the herbicide that GM crops resist, has risen almost 15 fold since so-called Roundup Ready, genetically engineered glyphosate tolerant crops were introduced in 19. 96. Uh, I'll get back to this in a second, but I want to show you another image that, that uh, shows uh, in, at a glance the impact and the importance of pesticides in South America. The blue dots in this graph represent tons of pesticides used in different regions of the world. And as you can see, South America is the region with the highest uh, tonnage of pesticide use in the world. And if you look at the 
black uh, rectangles, you see the growth between 1989 and 2020. So in, Latin, in South America, pesticide use has, growth, has grown 120% uh, in the last 20 years. So zooming in on Argentina, uh, you can see here the, the expansion of soybeans in this country uh, from the early 1990s until 2021. Uh, and in this graph, you can see the sort of the Argentine uh, aspect of this global pesticides I used that I was speaking about a minute ago. Uh, you can see here how the use of pesticides in Argentina, uh, especially since the introduction of GM soybeans grows uh, exponentially. So GM soybeans in Argentina are grown in now in 20 million hectares. That's almost 50 million acres. That's half of the agricultural land in Argentina. And again, to use in Massachusetts as a reference, this is 10 times the area of the state of Massachusetts. And Argentina produces 50 million ton, tons of soybeans per year. Uh, virtually all of this is exported. And this is uh, roughly 25% or one fourth of the Argentine exports that also bring $3 billion a year in export taxes for the national government. And the other side of this prosperity is the herbicides that I use seen in the, you see the containers in the image below, a picture that we took last year, because in any given year, 200 million liters of glyphosate, these herbicides uh, are used in Argentina. So this had a series of impacts, uh, of social and environmental impacts, what I call the dark side of the boom in my book. First, there, there have been violent land evictions suffered by peasants and indigenous families, particularly in the north of Argentina, that you can see in the map with a different shade here in the north. Uh, second, there has been um, the expansion of soybeans is linked to a series of ecological problems like deforestation, uh, the runoff of agrochemicals that contaminate water, water streams, and the appearance of weeds that resist herbicides. So uh, these super weeds uh, prompt farmers to use even more toxic herbicides. And I particularly study in the north of Argentina uh, situations of agrochemical exposure, particularly among marginalized populations. So this is what I uh, reflected here in the books that uh, Gabriela mentioned in the introduction. But now in this project that we are developing uh, with Dr. Joana Cunin, we are moving from the north to the Pampas in the center of Argentina. Um, and Joana, who is on the audience, I believe, uh, she's my collaborator. We are working together. She's an anthropologist at the Universidad Nacional de San Martín, UNSAM in Buenos Aires, and also a researcher at CONICET. And we have been doing interviews first on Zoom during the pandemic and then field work in uh, this um, rural worlds in the Pampas, these farming towns that you can see in this picture here. And the Pampas is this area that we circle here in the, in the map. And the darker the map, the higher uh, uh, acreage or hectares of soybean production. And this region in Argentina is the core of agrarian production in terms of cereals and oil seeds, and also in terms of the use of pesticides in the nation, around 80% of the pesticides used in Argentina are applied in this region. So uh, what we are investigating, or at least half of the project, uh, is what we presented in the article that we published in Revista, which, is, which uh, addresses these research questions that are also public questions in Argentina and other parts of the world. And this involves how do people reconcile, on one hand, the economic benefits that GM soybeans bring to their communities and the nation, and on the other hand, the claims about the negative environmental and health impacts of agrochemicals. So how do people in farming towns make sense of the unintended and undesirable consequences of economic prosperity? And this is the double-edged sword that we uh, refer to in the title of our article. Uh, so I forgot to set the timer, so I don't know how I'm doing with time, but <laughs> I'm going to uh, wrap two minutes. Two minutes, perfect. So I'm going to finish the presentation with a couple of quotes uh, that um, we uh, that we transcribed from an interview 
with a, a farmer that we call Hector. He's a pseudonym. He's a 70 year old man. Uh, his family, his parents had a, a small farm in the south of the province of Cordoba in the, the Pampas region. And now he uh, manages thousands of acres, thousands of acres uh, all around Argentina. He's been very successful. And uh, when he was talking to us about uh, soybeans, he said that when Roundup Ready, that, that is genetically modified Roundup Ready soybeans appear, it solved with problems in a very simple and economic way. This made the area grow tremendously because there were problems of perennial weeds that were quickly solved with glyphosate, this herbicide. So GM soybeans open new areas for production for farmers and also made production uh, simpler and more profitable for farmers. As he said, the farmer needed to dedicate fewer working hours to production, soil preparation, tillage with control and with RR soybeans, two, three or four sprays solve all the problems. So Hector praised the advantage of GM soybeans without missing that monoculture that is planting the same crop over large extensions have also ecological and social uh, issues. He said a monoculture uh, is of no use to anyone because a crop that is very easy to grow, such as soybeans, a very simple crop, makes people leave the countryside and go to town. Um, and he, like other farmers, also thinks about environmental issues related to these processes, but in different terms that social scientists or, or peasant social movements or environmental activists may think about. He said, when I talk about environmental sustainability, I'm thinking about soil erosion, about using all the resources well. And um, for many farmers, uh, soybeans have been a lifesaver or uh, even a once in a lifetime opportunity, but they also take some critical distance from this crop, at least some farmers. And this is how Hector put it. I expanded growing soybeans, but I'm not a soybean farmer. So he said, crecí con la soja, Económicamente, pero no soy sojero. So to wrap this up, um, I want to leave you with some takeaway questions uh, that speaks to this soybean boom in Argentina that could be both or either or both a curse and or a blessing, depending on different criteria that we can use or depending on your point of view on this. So the, the question that this boom brings up is what constitutes a healthy economic development, right? How how we can uh, achieve that, in whether if we, we, we want to achieve economic development through uh, this export crop. Second is what is important to preserve in the environment, right? For many farmers, what is need to preserve is the soil. Uh, and, um, and that's what the quote speaks about. And third and last, this brings about questions about how the benefits of agrarian export should be distributed. Uh, some farmers were made prosperous by this crop, while others went bankrupt, and uh, some marginalized populations were excluded uh, in the process. So I want to stop here uh, to give time to other speakers and conversation, but thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Pablo. And um, you raised some really fascinating questions, which I know definitely Angie is taking up in her own presentation. So we now turn to Patricio Winkler. Uh, Patricio is a professor at the Ocean Engineering School at Universidad de Valparaíso in Chile. He holds a PhD in civil engineering at Cornell University and three masters earned in Spain, England, and the United States. He has been a research fellow at the National University of Singapore, the University of Tokyo, and is the 2023-24 Cisneros Visiting Scholar at Dr. Klaas. Um, he has been awarded prestigious fellowships, including the Fulbright, the Matsumai Foundation from Japan, and Alpha Grant from the European Union. His research deals with coastal hazards and adaptation of coastal communities and infrastructure in view of climate change, tsunamis, and earthquakes. Thank you so much, Patricio, and... The floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, I was there last semester, so I'm kind of missing. And uh, well, to go straight to the point, um, so I belong to this ocean engineering school at Universidad de Valparaíso in central Chile. And what we do essentially is to study the coast and the ocean from the scientific, let's say, natural sciences and also engineering and technology. And uh, just wanted to say something about my stay last semester. So this is the, the group of uh, visiting scholars of last semester. I just uh, 
left a link there where I write some of the experiences we had while being there. It was a pleasure. And I learned a lot from people from social sciences and humanities. That, that was completely new for me. And it has changed uh, significantly the way I'm, I'm doing my research uh, from now. So it was a good experience. And June was part of that uh, process. So the, the talk is about coastal wetlands in Latin America. It's a big and huge, huge topic. So I will be focusing on just one, one particular site to uh, bring some examples on, on what are the main issues regarding this uh, these uh, environments uh, from the perspective of engineering and specifically uh, coastal engineering, climate change and that kind of stuff. So this is a drone uh, flight uh, in, in Coquimbo Bay, central part of Chile. It's a desertic area. I'm just showing, I started showing a place which is highly urbanized and now the drone has uh, made a, a turn and in the back we can see a very small wetland which is the remain of a huge area which used, used to be something like 3,000 hectares of wetlands in the in the 50s. Now there are just seven, only seven hectares of remaining wetland because of several um, causes that can be explained and will be explained as, as we, we go, we follow. One of the things I wanted to point is that Coastal wetlands. Uh, well, first, wetland is a very shallow uh, body of water. It's it's it depends on the on the country which you are uh, well uh, analyzing each wetland. It has different definitions. Yeah, but it, it and it's a, essentially a, a shallow uh, body of water. And coastal is essentially connected to the ocean. Yeah, I have here one book which I was just uh, looking uh, from Colombia. It's called Colombia Amphibia and talks about wetlands in Colombia. So this is just one example of the several wetlands we, we may find in Latin America. So uh, one of the things I wanted to say is that this is a very dynamic environment. So the coast is changing all the time because of several reasons, the tides, the waves, uh, in some other places, it can be the hurricanes, uh, we have tsunamis, earthquakes and all that stuff. And uh, so these are very special um, environments because they 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 have a, a combination of, 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 of water, but also specialized soils in which you have also very highly adapted uh, vegetation and uh, well the species that you may find so uh, now what what i wrote is in revista so that's june over there i put the link if you in case you want to share the uh, look at the, the the article it's just a chronicle i'm i'm very used to writing papers and scientific papers with lots of equations so they may may be very boring but this i i just tried to make the the effort to put in simple words. Now, uh, the study site would be Latin America. It's so variable. And if you look at this map, you'll see that, for example, there are some big rivers in the in the eastern coast of South America, Rio de la Plata, Amazonas, Orinoco. And those are basins and very, very, well, very wide uh, basins, which catch the water and actually bring that water uh, to the uh, river outlets. Uh, that's one of the um, connections between what happens inland and the coast. So we have to uh, understand that the coastal wetlands are a consequence of all, of, of a systemic, of a system, uh, which starts in the mountains uh, with uh, the all the contribution of pre of precipitation, snow, and so on, and then. Uh, all of that water comes to the coast and interacts with ocean variables. If we look at the Pacific coast of South America, then uh, the, the topography or well, the, the, the landscape changes a lot because of, we have a, a highly tectonic area. So coasts such as Peru and Chile and the south of Ecuador are uh, very often affected by earthquakes and they change dramatically the vertical position of the coast while uh, during uh, during one of those events and in 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 a way that changes significantly the way in which wetlands are are uh, uh, adapted to that kind of uh, situation if we talk about climate change so usually we talk about increasing temperature and that kind of stuff well climate change occurs in a very thin layer which is the atmosphere but it's connected to the wetland through the basin as i was saying so uh, if you remember, recall the hydrologic, hydrologic cycle that you learn at school. So whatever occurs in the atmosphere uh, through runoff, through rain runoff, 
eventually end, ends up in the coast. And here you can see some rivers in central Chile in which lots of sediment, suspended sediment, is uh, entering the ocean. And this is a connection. This is a clear connection by a satellite image. And it's not just sediments, it's also water, it's also nutrients, but it's also plastic, garbage, um, and so, well, all the bad things that we <laughs> used to throw to water. So there's a connection, there's a system, right? Now, uh, if we look at projections of temperature and precipitation in Latin America, uh, temperature is in the left panel. And you can see that, well, first thing is that the reddest, the most red areas are uh, will be affected by a largest increase in temperature. So and here you can see the, the buffering effect of the ocean. The ocean is very good at capturing uh, heat without increasing temperature, but inland, the, the change is significant. So we will have an increase in temperature and we all know that kind of stuff, yeah? But in the, in the central panel, there's something which is a bit more interesting. This is the precipitation and these are projections to say mid-century um, of uh, the mean precipitation, uh, year, yearly precipitation in, in, the, in different areas. And you see that for example, areas like South Chile, We'll have a reduction in precipitation, so we're we're gonna have less water. Well, in Ecuador, we will we'll have an increase in water. So the type of things that will affect uh, the Chilean uh, coast compared to Ecuador are very different. Probably in Ecuador, we may expect much more intense weather events, and here in Chile, we're gonna have an increase in drought. Um, so coming back to the connection between what happens in the atmosphere and in the in the coast. We may argue that a, a reduction in precipitation and an increase in temperature will end up in a uh, reduction in, in flow, water flow, river flow. And if you have less water in the rivers, then you cannot move sediments and you, you cannot move all the things that ba basically uh, uh, support the, the, the wetlands. Yeah, so this is just a, a comparison of one single wetland. It, it's actually a river uh, entering the, the central coast of Chile. And in 1930, for example, this river was connected with the ocean, while in this drone flight of 2022, the river has no force strength anymore to break that bar and connect to the water. What does this mean? So, and these are, these are a large scale, so these are several decades. And when we talk about climate change, we have to talk at least uh, beyond three decades, yeah? So here we have an example of what ha has been happening. And um, this can be um, attributed to, as I said, the increase in temperature, reduction in precipitation, but also in the way we are using the watershed, yeah? Upstream of this uh, particular wetland, uh, well, it's a river outlet, but it's now becoming a wetland because now it's, it's not connected to the ocean. There's lots of agriculture and we need water to you know, product, uh, make that product production. And uh, so one of the things that we are trying to understand from the scientific perspective is what is the role of this, all these forcings, mainly temperature, precipitation, land use, uh, whatsoever, and from the ocean part, what's the role of uh, increasing mean sea level, changing storminess, what are those um, the role of of all those uh, uh, particular forcings in um, in the behavior finally of this wetland of this of of several wetlands right so we see the change here yeah I'm gonna skip a little bit and I'm if I have time eh, Gabriela I'm not sure how, how how much do I have you have a minute and a half uh, you can take another so two minutes and a half if you need yeah perfect yeah. So just to finish an example, this is the same wetland I was showing. So you see that you have this, this, this shallow water uh, body of water. You also have vegetation. You have the interaction with the coast. And the things, uh, well, this is just an, an image on what how, how this area used to be in the 1947. Yeah, and um, in what's called the Plan La Serena, the, the Chilean president, Gabriel González Videla, wrote this, all these lines saying essentially that in those days, these wetlands, we call them wetlands nowadays, but in those days they were swamps and they were, as, I, as, as it's, it's written here somewhere, so they were uh, pestilentes, ah, yeah, emanaciones pestilentes, meaning that 
uh, well, the paradigm was completely different. And now we have we, we have much less wetlands uh, surviving all this uh, pressure from the, uh, urbanization. And probably uh, these words uh, are not uh, are not that uh, compatible with what we think today. So the, the change in, in the way we, we, we understand these bodies of water uh, has changed dramatically. One of the things uh, uh, that I want to say is that with uh, the increasing mean sea level, we're gonna start having these uh, sunny day floods yeah, this is a, a, a lighthouse immediately next to the, uh, the the wetland I was just showing. And this will happen. It's happening nowadays, for example, in Florida. So you have with high tide, you have flooding in lowlands of cities. And this is going to dramatically also change the way all these uh, wetlands behave because you, you're going to have an increase in the water. Then you're going to have more intrusion of salty water into these bodies of waters. And if salinity changes, then you have changes in vegetation and in the, generally speaking, in the ecosystem that it's uh, uh, in, in such particular wetland. I'm not gonna go through all these details. I just wanted to say that we have several uh, challenges uh, regarding the understanding of, of wetlands. My One of my challenges from the basic physical world is to interact with people what, which, uh, that are working essentially in ecology and in other, uh, disciplines which are not necessarily uh, embedded in, in the education of people that work with water, mainly hydrologists uh, or uh, civil engineers. And we need to merge and, and put all the effort in order to understand how these systems uh, behave beyond what's the physical or the ecological uh, uh, fraction of, of the system. Right? So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's much more technical, but, uh, well, I guess it's it was understood. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you so much, for, Patricio, for a really terrific uh, presentation. And it ties in very nicely with Erica's work. And let me introduce now er Erica Tenorio, or Erica Tenorio, who is an associate professor at Samorano University in Honduras. She holds a master's degree in aquatic ecology and water quality from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and a BSc in environmental engineering. She's currently carrying out research and outreach initiatives on watershed management and water quality. She has worked for several projects. She has worked on several projects on watershed restoration and, in, and management in Choluteca River Basin and in the northern coast of Honduras, where she has coordinated field work for watershed planning and water quality monitoring. Um, she is part of the UCCRN, which is the Urban Climate Change Research Network of Columbia University, and has coordinated initiatives on adaptation to climate, cha climate change in agriculture and for water resource management in coordination with multiple partners and donors. And as a reminder, we have a Q&A if you wish to start putting your questions in there. Thank you so much. And Erika, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriela, and, and thank you, June, for the opportunity. Um, I should have asked to go before Patricio because I don't have any cartoons, and so you'll see my presentation uh, very boring after after Patricio. But um, I'm I'm really happy to have this opportunity and with our colleagues, um, um, very uh, honored to to share uh, our article is not a research article per se. Um, it's an opportunity we see it as an opportunity to share our experience uh, of how we combine research outreach and academics in a small space of eight square miles, which is a catchment called Santa Ines. Um, most of you probably haven't uh, heard about Zamorano University. So I'm gonna start with that because most of our article goes around how we embrace our, our learning approach and how we combine our students in this initiative. And so we are located in Honduras, in Central America, where um, we are an agricultural university of over 4,000 hectares. We have 16 laboratories, eight processing plants, 10 production areas, eight research centers. And out of that land, 1,000 hectares are used for learning purposes. We have major water sources that supply our campus and that also become learning scenarios. And one of them uh, is uh, Santa Ynez catchment. Our student population is small. We have uh, approximately 1,200 students, 38% of them are female, and we receive students from 17 different countries. So we're not a Honduran university, we are, we are a Latin American university, and we really um, feel very proud about it. We offer four undergraduate programs, 
food science and technology, agronomy, which um, gathers most uh, of our students, agribusiness management, and our program, which is environmental sciences and development. And um, within program, we receive students that are interested in agriculture, but want to do uh, things differently. And uh, we also embrace um, the need for us to also contribute to the to the learning or the teaching of sustainability for the entire student population. Um, Santa Ines, um, well, Gabriela mentioned many of the challenges that uh, agriculture faces. And this area is no different than many of the watersheds in Central America and in Honduras. Um, you see it, an area that's very forested, but we have um, hill agriculture with not very sustainable practices. In the hillsides, we have extraction of water sources. We have a, a use of pesticides that is not the ideal uh, for, for the farming families or for the environment. And so we see, uh, we've found in Santa Ines this opportunity to, to have this teaching and learning scenario um, with elements that are very representative of rural farming in Central America. And that also provides a space for hydrological studies as well. So um, Zamorano decided about eight years ago to transform this abandoned farm in a training center for agroecology. Um, it's a small center of 40 hectares. And all of the students of Zamorano are going to go through the agroecological farm. We, um, we really recognize the need for our students to learn about sustainability practices, to compare with conventional agriculture, to understand challenges uh, of rural farming in Central America. And so we teach them to do soil conservation, regenerative agriculture, uh, to have organic alternatives for pest control and fertilization, to uh, understand the importance of cover crops, agroforestry, water harvesting. And while we do that within the farm, we also have uh, a family uh, that lives there, a family that's off the grid that has to uh, harvest their water that has to use uh, renewable energy sources that uses biogas to cook their their meals so that expose them also to um, the needs and demands of a uh, family um, in rural areas one important thing about our program is that and one of the brands that comes with uh, all of the steels that come with the zamrano education is the learning by doing uh, for our students, 50% of the academic uh, time has to be learning by doing. And that means that they're gonna have to um, cultivate, harvest, uh, do soil conservation practices, um, milk the cows, produce the cheese, sell the cheese. They are involved in many production chains from the beginning until the end. And this um, is very important for our model, not just because of the skills that the students acquire, through the, through the activities that they do every day, but mostly because um, the hard work is very value, valued for, for them. Uh, we, we also stress the importance of discipline, the value of uh, that hard work, and for them, it marks the, the future. Um, and in this case, we, we take them off campus and we bring them to these communities and this farm for them to have a better understanding of the challenges that the farming families uh, face. We're talking about poor soils, we're talking about variable weather patterns, uh, no access to technology, et cetera. So that gives them a separate vision of what we, uh, of what they're able to see in campus and opens their mind to these other challenges. Fortunately, we have established very good relationships with the communities uh, surrounding the farm and in the catchment. They are very proud to have us as a, a university, as neighbors, and they support our educational model. They become also teachers for our students. They help them with the research initiatives. They open the doors for the students to learn about what they do. Um, so it's a, a teaching learning scenario for and in both ways. Um, the research opportunities and the activities that we do in the farm define um, our outreach projects and how we design the projects and intervention in the area and we and how we look for funding from external donors to, to um, supply the needs for the communities, but also enriches our classroom strategy. So what we learn in Santa Ines, we bring to the classroom as well. 
And the applied research that we do also helps us support decision-making for the farmers. Um, through the research, we help them understand the impacts of climate variability and change. Um, that research also helps us provide insights on the importance of soil management practices uh, as adaptation to drought in the farms. We have, for instance, um, runoff uh, hillside, which is a demonstration scenario for what happens with the soil when it's not covered in terms of runoff, so they can see uh, and compare erosion under different scenarios. And in the picture, you can see um, one of the ladies that we've been working with, she is helping students and helping the research, the participatory research read uh, soil moisture uh, and record soil moisture data and compare what happens to soil moisture when the, the soil is covered versus when it's uncovered. Um, the promotion of practice that we do, um, we are, we have, we have it very clear that will reduce environmental impacts. But most importantly, the practice that we promote will increase their productivity. So they see the added value of having better productivity, better soils, and with less use of resources as well. The farm. Um, in the last couple of years, we've had over two hundred farmers that have been trained in sustainable practices. And this also with the support of multiple donors that, that see the need to have a training of trainers program. Uh, farmers from different parts of the country or even neighboring countries come to the farm, uh, learn the basics first, and then do a hands-on learning on the practices that they can go back and replicate to the, to the communities or to other uh, projects. Uh, some of them have also been technicians from some of the projects. And um, something that, and I know uh, Patricio also uh, gave a short explanation about, no, a good explanation about the hydrological cycle. So um, that helps us also understand for us. And since the early 2000s, right after Hurricane Mitch that hit the country pretty hard, uh, as Amarana, we've been involved in many watershed initiatives. And so since then we recognized that the catchment or the watershed is the ideal scenario for us to be able to connect soil and water relationships in terms of quantity and quality. Um, in the picture that you see above, those are two subcatchments of the Santa Ines catchment with different land use scenarios. Through our studies and our students doing research, we have been able to demonstrate the farmers how uh, having no soil conservation practices and more agriculture has a direct impact on the quality of the water in the streams down below and also how it impacts the um, the base flow uh, within the catchment and that information presented to the communities have also helped us to uh, create uh, a watershed council which is a mechanism a mechanism to increase water governance it's a figure and the Santa Ines one is one of the few in the country where water boards, farmers, community leaders participate in an organization that understands the challenges of having deforestation and no soil conservation practices and takes action and, and plans for activities to reduce those impacts. And um, all of those activities uh, that we promote um, in terms of soil conservation practices with the Watershed Council, Forest Protection and Management, uh, recognize that for the farmers to be involved and to be motivated, we also need to come up with ideas and solution to the pressing problems that they have in terms of water access. Uh, first and most importantly, access for human consumption, but, but also water for irrigation and water for hygiene. So through also different donors and projects, we've been able to uh, construct or build water storage tank, provide support for irrigation systems. And uh, um, in the picture, you can see during the pandemics, um, students at some point were ready to go back to school, but the schools had no uh, water. So doing the hand washing and preventing diseases for the for the schools was, was complicated. So we're helping them with the small activities that help improve their access to water as part of as part of these initiatives. We we know there there's much to do. This is the last one. So, so just wanna say that um, we know, we recognize we have many challenges in the catchment, even if it's small. 
Um, this is kind of like a starting point for us to have this connection with it, with the communities, with the students, with the research, with the donors, with the university itself, to identify this site as a great opportunity to have an impact in different aspects. So again, we know there's much to do, but um, we're really happy and passionate about the work that we've done there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erica, for giving us this really fantastic view into local initiatives. And I think um, you and Patricio, there's a really rich conversation that is going to happen in a few minutes, I suspect. Um, our final guest is Angie Higuchi, uh, P who has a PhD and master's degree in agricultural economics with, specialty, with a specialty in food marketing from Kyushu University in Japan. She graduated with business management engineering from the Universidad Nacional Agraria La Molina in, in Peru. Her main research topics are food marketing, rural development, food safety, and food security. She's a full-time associate professor and researcher at the Academic Department of Business Administration in La Universidad del Pacifico in Lima. Thank you so much, Angie. Thank you, Gabriela, and thank you, June, for the opportunity as well. Um, okay, I'm going to share with you my presentation. And as you can see, uh, you can see a, a picture of empty containers of pesticides where in the, well, we call Chillon, the Chillon Valley, which is in the north part of Lima. And we call this north part of Lima, um, this um, agriculture lettuce and broccoli um, pantry of fresh fruits and vegetables to be distributed to Lima. Uh, what I wanted to, to do actually today is not, just talk about what Luis Gomero, who is a professor and, and a researcher as well, uh, does uh, in the Chillon Valley, which are just uh, these this, um, three fields about collection of empty pesticides containers, not just about that, but also about the research that I'm conducting regarding quinoa and how we connect this that we, we can see in the field with what we found in the bags of quinoa that we are eating in, on our tables. So um, this is Luis Gomero in the picture, but I'm going to um, show you the results of pesticides that we found in these bags, despite the fact we have um, banning banning process within Peru about metamidolphos and chlorpyrifos. We have found that. And also um, in these field trips, Luis Gomero with his students also found the same pesticides in these containers, pesticide containers. So um, you may know in 2013, we, we have this International Year of Quinoa. And everybody started to eat quinoa, even Beyonce, Demi Moore, all the stars, all the cinema, um, movies, stars and, and actors and actors. So it became very, very famous. And also in Peru became also famous because despite the fact that the quinoa is a local food, and we, we really, we, we fed this quinoa to animals before we knew that it had a lot of nutrients. So also in Peru started to grow up this um, consumption. So I'm going to show you, well, these are the objectives um, and, and what happens when um, crop starts to be like a, like a spot starlight and uh, you don't have enough area to cultivate that crop. You start to do what Pablo said. We, we you start to have monoculture, then you have risks on your health. The the farmers who who spread these pesticides on the crops also risk their health. We now it's it's um, amazing how we have more cancer, more problems, liver problems endocrinological problems as well with hormones and all the stuff. And we don't know why, but it is related to pesticides indeed. And this is one of the pesticides, although 
you don't know the name very well, but it's called metamidophos, and in can, it can um, cause you not just uh, overstimulation uh, in, on your nervous system, but also you can get cancer if you consume it uh, a lot, because of course uh, it is um, bioaccumulating in your uh, immune system. And also chlorpyrifos is another pesticide which is very, very harm, uh, harmful to your health, especially also to your nervous system and also ecologically speaking. So let me show you how um, these international pressures, because of course, all of you want to eat quinoa cost in Peru, in this case in Peru. First of all, these are the main export markets uh, where we export our Peruvian quinoa. In the United States, America is the main the main uh, country that uh, import from us this quinoa. I'm talking about locally. I wanted to show you how um, regionally we are divided. We have the yellow place, which is called the coast, which is very humid. And when it is very humid, you need pesticides. Then you have the brown line, which is um, the highlands, which is um, which has hate and also is dry. So you don't need pesticides over there. That's why the quinoa from Puno or from Ayacucho or from the highlands are the best quinoas uh, around the world. And uh, another thing that you may know is that uh, between Peru and, and uh, Bolivia, we have almost 80% of all the real quinoa around, around the world. But it is, as you can see, it is dry and also high. So that's why you can have organic quinoa itself. But in the coast, you need to spread pesticides because humidity attracts pests. So there is no another way to grow up crops like these, which are Andean, pure Andean crops like quinoa. So what I wanted to show you is the secondary data with the years and from 2013, which was, you know, the International Year of Quinoa, declared by FAO, by FAO, how it increases in Arequipa. Arequipa is part of the coast. As I said, the coast is very humid. So you may, you know, displace, uh, displace some crops, local crops from Arequipa, which is part from the coast, to grow up quinoa. And as you can see, the um, the hectares started to grow to double or triple in 2013 from 2012. And then it starts to grow eight times in 2014 in Arequipa and also in the total coast part, as I said. But look at Puno in this period of time, 2013 to 2016, which is the golden period of, of uh, this quinoa uh, thing, quinoa boom that we call, Puno is part of the um, highlands and it's next to Bolivia with the Titicaca Lake. And as you can see, it's constant. You see, the, the hectares are constant. And also in the in the Sierra, which is the highlands, are constant. The you know the, the big um step was in Arequipa and also in the, the total coast, because they had to expand the area in order to grow quinoa for, um, you know, um, how to say, calming down the demand that we had for, for this crop. Also happens uh, here, as you can, say, uh, you can see as well, right? Uh, Arequipa and the coastal region in the period of time of 2013 to 2015. What happened in 2015? That uh, the containers started to be banned in America. They found this kind of pesticide that I show you, like, and they return back as the containers. That's why the price, the hectares, the yields started to be lowered, right? Uh, in, in, since 2015, 2016, everything. So what is happening uh, actually um, with this uh, international pressure? We have this ecological shifting effect. First of all, we increase or expand the area that is naturally for other crops 
for the crop that is in demand internationally. Also, we have this ecological rebound effect. So uh, that, for instance, you have um, a, a maximum yield that you, that you can have, but if you put pesticides, then you can have double or triple that yield. So we have that rebound effect uh, because then you have to abandon the land and uh, uh, you have to, to make it, you know, air the, the land in order to grow another crop. And then you have this ecological cascade, which um, um, derives in soil salinization, in erosion, or plaques, plaques, plaques that are different, difficult to control. So what we did here in Peru, in Lima, with the University of Pacific, La Universidad de Pacifico, we bought some uh, bags of quinoa, local bags, domestic bags of quinoa that we cook usually for eating every day. Um, and in this opportunity, we just had budget for four bags, one organic and three conventionals. Uh, I'm going just to, to show you these uh, four results. Uh, but later on, we expand the, um, the research. We got some money, some extra money to expand the research to 27 bags. And thanks God, we we reached to publish this in in Agrociencia, which is a Mexican um, Mexican journal, uh, actually. And thanks God, we did that because we also contributed to um, public politics here in in Peru, because this uh, was like a hot topic last year. And uh, what we found, first of all, I wanted to say that in November 2020, uh, metam metamidophos was uh, banned from the market. Also, chlorpyrifos also was banned from the market. But when we analyzed the four bags, as you can say, see over there, the white label brand, the brand A, brand B, I, I didn't put the brand, but uh, I wanted just to show you, and the organic brand, the red spots or the red numbers are the ones which uh, the numbers which sub surpass the European Union uh, maximum um, levels of pesticides or maximum residues levels that um, that a bag, for instance, should have. So we found this chlorpyrifos with this metamidophos uh, in 2020, and then we conducted another analysis in 2021. We did not find metamidophos anymore, but we still found chlorpyrifos and another um, uh, harmful pesticide. And then we conducted another another um, bug collection, and uh, uh, we found this um, chlorpyrifos again. So I wanted just to show you how how international effects or international demand affects or causes an effect on uh, the crops that we export. But also we have problems with the domestic um, domestic food that we eat. Uh, this food grow up by small scale farmers. And Luis Gomero, this professor help, uh, helps to show how these containers, plastic containers of pesticides are related to what we are eating and are um, also showing to authorities that um, we are eating very bad. We are um, dumping these, these uh, containers to, to the fields and also uh, we are damaging the, the, the environment. So as you can see, domestic controls are not so rigorous here in One Peru. Minute. I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. Um, quality standards for international markets should be the same as national market here in Peru as well. Uh, Peruvian authorities should uh, adopt uh, the common agricultural policy from the EU and also organic production, although it's very difficult in the coast part, you can reach it. Um, should be promoted as well and should have the, you know, a high price because of course it's organic. That's all for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, 
We are really set for a really wonderful conversation right now. And I want to remind you to please put your questions in the Q&A section. But I want to start us off with some questions to the panelists while you get a chance to write in your questions. And um, I, I, my first question actually is, I'll start in the different order, is to Angie. This was a, a really provocative presentation that you have given us in terms of um, uh, speaking about what gets banned and why it gets banned. So my question has to do with um, the quinoa that is consumed locally. Does this have, does this uh, need to have the same standards as the European standards for the consumption? And if it, if it doesn't, or if it does, does Peru have a, a control system in which it can, like your university was doing, uh, testing the internal consumption of quinoa to see what are the rates of pesticides that are still being found. Because it's interesting to note, is it a different standard for export and import? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, we do not have any oh, control. And you can, I'll just give the four questions, if, if that's okay. Okay. Yes. So, um, and then just to keep the, the conversation going, um, and Pablo, I was really struck by the quote that you gave from that farmer where he says, crecí económicamente, pero no soy sojero. And that really made me think about another quote that you had in your paper, what said, what's good for agriculture is good for everyone in town. And in the time that you have been studying this project, has there been a changed understanding of what cost benefit is in terms of what does the gains of soy bean production, as opposed to the health and ecological consequences. Has that remained the same or have um, farmers began to organize to have a different understanding of nature, their bodies and the impact that these have on, on, the, on, 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 on everything? And I have a, a similar question for both Patricio and Erika. And this has to go with this Wonderful image that you painted, Patricio, of this interconnect, it really showing, really wonderfully showing how interconnected everything is, from the mountains to the ocean, and that we can't have a single or singular solution because it is an interconnected system. And uh, putting that in conversation with what Erika was, was uh, showing us in terms of this local university and the local solutions, made me think about the difficulties of interregional um, solutions, but also in terms of wetlands that do not respect international borders. Well, how does that work with creating a, a regional or international um, solution for the wetlands? And I'm thinking here of that terrific photo that you showed from the 1930s, and I think it was the 2020s, or that those two contrasting images where have we reached the tipping point that we cannot go back, that engineering solutions will not get the river to go to the ocean, that we have reached a point of no return um, in, in the areas that you're studying. And, and Erika, that was such an inspirational um, presentation in terms of what is being done at the local level. I was really interested in potential um, obstacles for the, the curriculum is amazing and how the students are being taught, but how is this then translated to the general farmer and to those who may not have access to the classes or to the universities? How is that knowledge um, disseminated beyond those who have this wealth of information because the university is there? Um, and I think um, I will stop there, but and I see questions, so if we can go around and everyone can answer and we'll turn then to the questions, June, if that works. Oh, I think you're muted, June. Yes, that's fine. Um, the way we're going to do the questions after the round is I'll take one from in the room and then Gabriella will take one online and we'll switch off. That means everyone in the room has to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want, June, we can start with the room and people can, uh, our panelists can answer as they wish. Okay. Question. Or do you want to answer the... 
Yeah. Yeah. So answer the, why do you answer the questions too? Okay. Uh, shall we so start with all, Oh, Angie, yes. Uh, my Myself, because it was the first one, right? Yes. Okay, so to your question, actually we do not have any control in Peru. It's, it's terrible. I think it's, it's the same in Mexico, I think. I, I guess, I guess. And, and same as in other countries in Latin America as well. You know, there was a similar research that, um, you know, the one, one researcher, I think, and one person from media wanted to do. But I have to say that each um, sample that you are, you know, um, you, you are working with at the laboratory level cost $250 per kilo, per unit. So they had the budget and they conducted this so-called research because it was 50 different crops that they collected from fresh markets. And uh, Peru's or Peruvian Agricultural Safety Service said that the sample was not representative. That's why I said, okay, I'm going just to research about quinoa and I'm going to try to find out, to find out, find out <coughs> 27 uh, sample size um, that should be representative for the quinoa crop. And as it costs two hundred fifty dollars per kilo, the you know the laboratory experiment. Um, small farmers here they do not have that budget. You know, it's it's too expensive for them. Um, no one can control this uh, because, of course, mm, some farmers are saying, "Okay, I'm going to spread pesticide in order to grow, for instance, potato," and you have this potato because you, you need yields, right? Um, but for them, for their self-consumption, they maybe they have their own potatoes, small potatoes that they self-consume them. Um, it's very difficult, very, very difficult to control this issue because it uh, pesticides, harmful pesticides are spread all over the crops, not just quinoa, but I'm telling you over the whole crops. And it's very, very difficult to, to control this. And even if you spread the pesticides and you have a field, organic field next to this conventional field, um, you know, the air and the soil, the water contagion itself uh, to the other to the other field. It's very, very difficult to control legal legally, um, environmentally speaking, um, uh, technically speaking, and also regarding budget as well. So it's very, very difficult. This is the, the, the very complicated situation that we are facing. And of course, last year, which was a hot spot, this topic was a hot spot, um, many Peruvians uh, by social media started to say uh, the government doesn't protect us, doesn't protect our health. But government desestimate this. Uh, they say, okay, no, no, they didn't reply. They didn't Thank do anything, so much, and we are still in this situation. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Um, I don't know Pablo? who. Uh, Pablo, Patricio. Yeah. Uh, okay, Gabriela, thank you for the question. It was related with the interconnection of, of this system, very complicated system. First, I'm going to go uh, fast. First, that uh, hydrological cycle is a very old <coughs> concept because it doesn't consider the human in the, in the whole water cycle. So uh, it's just purely physical. And that's a big knowledge gap we need to face. So we need to introduce the... the the role of the human within the hydrological cycle in order to make it more comprehensive and more real. Now, uh, as for you, you were talking about the boundaries and, and indeed, so there are some geographical boundaries which you may have at different levels, national, whatever, uh, but you also have moving boundaries from these uh, water bodies. So they are not static. As I said, the, the coast always moves, but if you have a wetland, it also shrinks or, well, eventually it can be flooded. So it's, it's very hard from the, let's say, land use point of view to define what's specifically a wetland. So, so I guess that that's not solved at all. 
the one of the challenges we have. And the other challenge we have is that so far we have tried to understand this as these systems from the purely multi but not interdisciplinary point of view. So hydrologists and uh, hydrological people, they do understand how water moves, then you have ecologists, but we need to merge them. So we 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 do have knowledge gaps, but we 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 are lacking or we do have stronger knowledge uh, gaps in terms of bridges between disciplines. And the last thing I wanted to say is that governance is very complicated. So we've been talking about integrated watershed management for decades, and there are some cases in which this has worked, for example, in the Netherlands, there are some places in which this hasn't hasn't worked at all. For example, in Colombia, there was a Corp Magdalena. I was in, uh, invited at some point to discuss the way in which they were making this kind of integrated water management, but it ended up uh, in, in some kind of wrong circumstances or whatever. And the last thing is, um, so engineering. Engineering for sure is short, is short. And we need to go to some other alternatives such as regulating land use. For example, in places which are not urban, which are rural or transitional, then we need to strengthen the, the land use plannings by defining specifically what, uh, what the wetlands are, try to, uh, um, in a way, capture the idea that they move and, and then define, for example, a different type of land uses, which, which may be, uh, for example, um, let's say, well, um, not so intense as, as 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 it happens in the cities. So, well, that's it. Sorry, <laughs> too long. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. We have a lot of questions in the room and in online. So, uh, if Erika and Pablo, if you can keep your answers short, I'm so sorry, but I will cut you off because I see that there are very anxious people in both in the room and in the chat to have their questions asked. Uh, yes. I, I, I want to. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, oh, so Pablo, can we let uh, Erika so she can follow oh, yeah, up sorry. on Patricia's? Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Gabriela. You were asking about the challenges and and, and how we can expand this knowledge to local farmers. Um, in Honduras, uh, I don't know if in, in the rest of the Central American region and other countries, but the role of extension, unfortunately, um, relies on the product on the producers or, the, or sellers of agrochemicals. At this moment, the farmers, most of the farmers in the rural areas in our country, the only access they have to a technician is to the technician that will sell them agrochemicals. And so, so we recognize the need to do and to have more extension, to have more approaches to the farmers. We we know that that's a challenge, but we see opportunities and the projects that we've had in the past have been uh, projects related or with funding related to adaptation to climate change. Any activity that will improve soil, that we do soil conservation, watershed management is an adaptation strategy to climate change. So um, there's an opportunity to channel channelize this funding uh, related to climate change into these activities and to do more, more extension. Uh, when we do this kind of work, we also, uh, and going back to Patricia, and I'm gonna try to be very brief, we, we tell communities, we tell leaders, okay, climate change is a threat, but look at what is the major threat um, also in terms of the human part of the hydrological cycle. Uh, but with combining the external funding for climate change with what we know about the hydrolog uh, hydrology and dynamics of the catchment, um, I think there's potential to do uh, more things. We are migrating to doing uh, YouTube videos, uh, training for training, pro training for trainers program, and doing online training for other university students that are interested in agroecological practices and adaptation to climate change. So, th so that's that's a start for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erika. Pablo. Yeah. So um, briefly. Um... So what's the cost benefit analysis that farmers make? Yeah, definitely that has been changing when they started using glyphosate. This herbicide was a kind of like a miracle at the end of the 90s. Uh, by now they're starting to notice uh, the effects on their health, uh, but um, they are very, they become very uh, protective or defensive. I mean, the farmers, when they are attacked by, you know, sort of outside actors like environmentalists or politicians about the, the impacts of this. So that's why I think it's important to do ethnographic in-depth studies because you get to these visions only when you gain the, the you know, rapport with, with them. And the second thing that I'll say um, 
is that in this cost benefit uh, approach, uh, what's a benefit sometimes is intangible or it's not like measure in a dollar amount, meaning that for them, uh, these, uh, these crops that have a, a global market allow them to uh, reproduce or keep their identity as farmers and as successful farmers. So for them, it's not only to make money, but also to uh, stay uh, you know, um, at the sort of forefront of uh, agricultural technologies. And also, uh, and, and finish with this, um, they are also, they see themselves as the first one in, in, in their family to quote unquote, make it, right? So they're, they're, they're people around my age or older, like you know, 40 something or, or close to 50, uh, their, their parents didn't make it uh, with farming. Their grandparents, you know, arrived, they were migrants from Italy, some of them, and this is, they they struggled to buy land. So they are the first one to to actually like, you know, making uh, good bucks with agriculture. So there's also like, there's an economic component, but there's also a cultural component of sort of intergenerational sort of, um, uh, you know, reward and say like, you know, I, I'm honoring my my ancestors, so to speak, uh, by actually making money with, with this activity. So I can speak more about this, but uh, I will keep it at that. Thank you so much, Pablo. And we pass it to you, June. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks to all the panelists and our wonderful moderator. And I would welcome a question from somebody in this room. Christian. <laughs> Why don't you say who you are? Uh, well, hi, my name is uh, Christian. I'm a doctoral candidate at Yale uh, and had the wonderful opportunity to contribute a small piece to, uh, to this issue. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this panel. It's been very interesting for me. Uh, my question, I'll, I'll pose it as a general question to anybody who wants to take it up. Uh, but speaking about these forms of pesticide dependent monocrop agriculture, uh, mostly by smallholders uh, or small farmers. Uh, I'm curious if uh, about the margins where this form of agriculture has been rejected, uh, where instead there's opting in for heirloom crops or subsistence only agriculture uh, or indigenous or local practices. Uh, what do you see as uh, perhaps that's the minority in, in uh, your research sites, but do, does that form of agriculture still exist at uh, at the margins, and what it, what role does it have to play? Uh, is there something to uh, these uh, non less globalized or uh, non uh, monocrop forms of agriculture that that uh, can actually benefit uh, the farmers who are caught in this difficult economic bind? Does anyone want to take a stab at that really fantastic question? I can I can say one one word about it. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it's really hard for small farmers uh, not not using pesticides or like making a minimal use because they are oftentimes uh, surrounded by you know uh, farms that that use them. So. In the you know the book that I uh, previously published, uh, I study I work with the small farmers in the north of Argentina, and they were growing cotton for the market, but they were also growing uh, cassava uh, for for you know self consumption and corn and other uh, vegetables for for them and to sell in local markets. But the problem that they have is that because the the lands where they live are very cheap. So it'd be farmers to expand their scale, start to rent uh, land there. And uh, the, the herbicide glyphosate was taken to their farms by a, by a pesticide drift and killed their farm. So they started to adopt actually genetically modified cotton, replacing those crops with genetically modified cotton to avoid the effects of pesticide drift. So I think it's really hard. And also it's really hard because in even in the in farming worlds, these non-market or uh, products that are grown as food rather than as feed or as, as crops for sale are sort of like seen as a as a hobby more than a more than as something that you do as a farmer. You're you're not seen as a real farmer if you don't produce crops for the market or for export. So that there's also I think that cultural aspect 
that sort of uh, downplays the farming for subsistence. That you know, for urban for people like us, for urban people, it's like this heirloom, like sort of like niche, nice market. But in their world, I think is is in looked down, you know, by other farmers. If you don't use pesticides, that is sometimes the macho thing to do, or the sort of like a technological advanced thing to do to grow GM crops and and those kind of uh, products. If I may, yeah, sure. um, regarding Peru, thanks God, we have a moratorium uh, to ban genetic modified crops till December 31, 31st, 2035. Thanks God. Why? Because Peru is not flat. You know, it, we have the coast, mountain range, and then we have the jungle. So we have many, many crops, different climates, 104 life zones within the country. They wanted to impose the genetic modified crops, but you must need to grow monoculture. And that is impossible in Peru. That's why um, many researchers uh, joined, conjoined with politicians were against the gen genetic modified crops. But I, I must say that uh, in the North part, they are trespassing the, you know, the seeds and growing up, for example, corn. And we cannot avoid that because, you know, from Ecuador, from Colombia, it comes and, and, and farmers grow up these seeds. They, they say that, this, that those are better and then corn starts to grow and then uh, it contagious the, the other crops, the, the Andean ones and the local ones. So it's, it's very difficult. And regarding to the pesticides, uh, as well as um, Pablo said, it's very difficult, at least in the coastal part and the jungle part, to avoid using that. Um, the thing is that uh, maybe it, something that we can do is to teach farmers which kind of pesticides we can use maybe not the harmful ones, the most harmful ones, but then, then you have the green green ones, which are, you know, not so, not, not, not so harmful. And also another technique should be, you know, uh, when you are spreading to the plant, you should not, because farmers do not know, and they just spread the, you know, the thing that the pesticide and, and they uh, wait to, to have the plant all wet. You should maybe, spread that in, in the spots that you should spread in the in, in the vegetable and the fruit and then you can have less uh, pesticide usage but everything goes with uh, technical assistance with more knowledge uh, with the you know politic support as well um farmers who want to be organized because they are you know individual more most of them they are individual ones and small scale thank you uh, it's a lot of, of work to do mm. so angie sorry for cutting you off we have so many questions both in the room hey, i'm and sorry in the... <laughs> it's so, your turn Gabriela, for an online so question uh so we have a question um from Alberto Kritzler, uh, can you share cases of successful reconversion from overuse of agrochemicals back into sustainable agricultural practices? And um, regarding teaching, and I think this is a, a question for Erika, or informing training farmers, how do you deal with misinformation and marketing? Is it a significant obstacle? So uh, both questions from Alberto. Uh, Erika, would you want to take that one of the, the second one? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, so mo the one mostly related to education and how we deal with misinformation, right? Um, so what we do in our approach is to have the farmers to be at the farm and show themselves what the impacts are of changes in the practices. Um, so, so for us, the two things that bringing them to the agroecological farm in this case is key uh, for them to understand how the 
best practices will have an impact in the production and the reduction of the impacts and a model for um, ECAS, which are Escuela de Campo or farmer field schools, uh, in which one of the farmers shows their neighbor farmers within his or her farm uh, what the impacts of the activities or the changes of activities are. So those are models that I think it's imp that are important to replicate because in that way, um, you don't have to tell the farmer, the farmer can see for, uh, for himself or for herself what the impacts of the change of practices are. Mm -hmm. And the, there was a one, the first part was about um, seeing sus, uh, substantial changes, right, in production? Yes, yeah, successful reconversion from overuse of agrochemicals back into sustainable agricultural practices. And I think several on the panel can answer that one. Um, or did you also want to take a stab into that one? Just briefly, yes, we've seen uh, with some of the farmers, but it's it's very complicated. It, cons it continues to be um, a challenge because uh, the farmer will hardly take the risk of losing his crop. Um, so they prefer to apply agrochemicals and not lose the farm. And so it continues to be a challenge, even uh, when they know the alternatives. Um, it's something that we still have to continue working with. Was that a, a hand? Okay, um, back over to in the room. Okay. Um, I believe you had a question. Yeah. Could yes. you say who you are? Yeah, I'm Jaime. I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology. And my question is about the political identities of um, you know, these rural of these people who you know live in these rural worlds. I'm completely talking about uh, the category and the political identity of campesino and campesinado. And I was wondering if any of you can say something about that. Like, does that category holds, still holds, you know, when we think about rural words in Latin America and those different cases, uh, let's say because of the agribusiness and the um, international export, uh, that has changed the way that people, you know, uh, talk about themselves. Do they use the word, you know, like campesino, campesinado, or that's something in the past that really doesn't say much about the current circumstances. In Latin America. I'm saying this because, for example, in Colombia, there is a current debate about, you know, the political recognition of campesinado as a political category. So I was wondering if these rural wars are talking about, that's something that happens and that's important. No, uh, regarding to Peru, it doesn't have, you know, this political political recognition as in Colombia, as you are saying. Um, but I must say that now campesinos are more recognized than before because with the climate change thing, we are having less crops and we are like starting to evaluate and um, how to say it's like... Um, put the campesino in a better spot or better place than before. People are recognizing that the food that they are eating on their tables or they are having on the table for eating um, comes from them. So they are like, there's like a, a small change in the way that uh, we see campesinos because before we saw, beautifully, we saw campesinos maybe down but now things are changing due to this climate change, prices, and the importance of food on the table. So that is something that I can say from Peru. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on that? Pablo? Okay, then over to Gabriel. Or I think Pablo, Pablo? had his uh, quickly I wanted to say that in Argentina, I think it's interesting that it was a, Unlike other countries, where campesinado was much more important than other places, there is a resurgence of of the 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 term and the identity as campesinos in the north of Argentina uh, is very different in the pampas where I'm doing uh, 
research now. Uh, but I think it's also interesting, uh, at least for the case of Argentina, how campesinos themselves use different, this is what I noticed in my research, they may, they may call themselves differently depending on who are they're talking to. So if they are in a mobilization, they can call themselves campesinos or in front of researchers like us. But then in other instances, they will speak to, they refer to themselves as pequeños productores or pequeños agricultores when they speak to policymakers and when they when they try to speak the sort of like the, the jargon of uh, policy. Uh, so I think it's also important to, to notice like kind of the, the performative aspect of, of the of this category as well. So, um, do you know, yes, I'll merge two questions. Um, one from Hector Fletes, who's asking about the degradation of traditional knowledge, but there are always groups of individuals who try to recover both knowledge and ecosystems. We should also think about the nutrient production capacity per hectare and not just volume, which I agree. But I want to turn that question, expand it a little bit to make it a question for Patricio and ask um, in these movements to look at these watersheds, these these areas, how much or does it play a role in local indigenous knowledge or local traditional knowledge play a role in how these solutions are being solved? And then there was a quick question um, for Angie, how has the cost of quinoa for local people changed as a result? And if you can keep that into a short uh, and we'll start with you, Patricia. I'm going to make it simple because I'm not a social scientist. I can just say what I feel from my gut. So sorry for that. <laughs> but well, for sure, I mean, a local agricultural practices can be, can be uh, well, usually sustainable because uh, they, they are not maimed in order to make a production. So so essentially, if, if you keep it local, it's OK. But that that's something that anyone can tell you. So it's not wise. It's just like a, I'm just, you know, reproducing what I've heard from specialists. Sorry for that. <laughs> Let's talk about physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Angie, could you answer that? Uh, give us a quick response, because uh, I see that there's one more remaining question in June's room. Yeah, I wanted to to answer Anne, which, um, who, who made the, the question. Actually, um, the price is pushed by international prices regarding quinoa. So um, organic always has a better price uh, if you compare that to conventional one. Uh, but because small scale farmers are very individual and also very poor, um, the ones who have the control or the highest position in the market is the enterprise and the wholesalers who have truck. So they can approach to small scale farmers, to each small scale farmer to offer price very ridiculous price, very small price. And because farmers are very poor, they accept. Um, it is different if they are well organized, for instance, in a cooperative that they can have a power of negotiation, for instance, for, with, um, with a, I don't know, with an international enterprise, international company or export company that can get a better price. But uh, as long as the small scale farmers are not or well organized, then they can, you know, give away their, their quinoa for very little price, even though it is organic. Very difficult. Thank you so much, Angie. And uh, June? Okay. Um, who in the room has a question? Okay, Dan. Oh, go ahead. Catalina, say who you are. Um, hi, I'm Catalina Dango Walker, and I'm a fellow at Alter Plus uh, currently. And, and I am an Indian quinoa lover. So. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask if how do governments or health authorities inform consumers about the dangers of eating uh, genetically modified uh, crops or, um, in, in this case, um, highly, highly um, um, what's that? spray, uh, spray uh, quinoa with, with chemicals? Uh, so how, how, do, uh, how do they, they, uh, they uh, make aware of the aware of people about the dangers of eating that for, for their health. Thank you very much for your question. We don't have that. The government always hide this information and uh, they remain 
this I mean they have the information they have it but they keep uh, quiet about this uh, for instance what I wanted to say is uh, for this research regarding quinoa uh, I found out one document from uh, the, this Peruvian agricultural safety service that said that in almost all the regions in Peru they spread high pesticides just in quinoa because I, I, I just researched it in quinoa but also we have you know spread it in over all, all crops and uh, once last year once the media started to push um uh, with this um uh, scandal that we are eating you know food full of banned pesticides international banned pesticides um uh, this uh, Peruvian Agricultural Safety Service started to, how to say, uh, hide this information. I could not find the documents anymore as before. So that is the, the question. We are like silenced. And even, you know, the Ministry of Agrarian Development and Irrigation or the Peruvian Institute for the Defense of Competence and the Protection of Inter Intellectual Property and Consumption, they are not helping us uh, regarding this. They are not informing us. We have to conduct private research in order to show up these kind of things, really. It's, it's very like shameful, but this is the situation in Peru. Many people do not know what they are eating. And then they are getting very severe illnesses. We have, if you, you see the charts uh, regarding cancer, how breast cancers, how stomach cancer, uh, hormonal cancers uh, uh, started to raise up uh, uh, year by year. We don't know why, but we are connecting this with the food, definitely. Definitely, we, because we are eating very bad. And even though you are uh, going to buy organic food, in my research, we, we, we found that, that even though it says organic, it, it, it has pesticides and very harmful pesticides, the ones that are banned internationally. So sometimes they even say it's organic because of uh, marketing, but it is not organic or, or not organic at all. No, not organic. So yeah. we are yeah, at yeah. time. Um, okay, you want to take one more question? Let's see. I Okay, so we are at time, but we'll take one more question. On, oh. online okay so online i think we have um so we have would uh diego osorio would like to know what the panelists think of agroecology as a resilience building framework and what is needed from policymakers to strengthen this why don't we turn it to uh those who have not spoken recently patricio pablo or erica and then <laughs> again <laughs> or, or no, Bob, you can pass it on to somebody. say anything wise about agroecology. Sorry for that. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Pablo? Uh, no, what I will say that uh, shortly to kind of combine the last two questions, very good both. Uh, I think agroecology will be a potential solution, as, as Diego suggests, uh, for the issues that we are raising here. Uh, in terms of going back to the previous question about eating GM crops, I wanted to say that uh, soybeans are mostly used by the food industry as emulsifiers and corn is used for uh, high uh, fructose syrup. So um, many colleagues in Argentina may hate me for this, but I think farmers have a point when they say that all this pressure put on glyphosate and herbicides is barking at the wrong tree because uh, if, at least in Argentina, there's a lot of pressure on that herbicide, but much less control by the government on the pesticides on the food that you can buy at a grocery store at the corner of your house on zucchini or lettuce or tomatoes. And that is barely control and might have, might have much more uh, toxic herbicides like the one that Angie was mentioning than the, you know, the herbicide you can find in soybeans that will be process into an emulsifier that goes into a cereal bar. I'm not saying that that's not harmful, but it's less direct than what you can find in a head of lettuce. Erika? 
Yeah, um, briefly, um, what do we think of agroecology? Well, uh, we transformed this farm into an agroecological farm and we have included into our curricula agroecology for all of our students because um, it's a marvelous umbrella for uh, regenerative agriculture, for conservation of soils, for organic agriculture. Uh, we need to teach the new generations about this alternative. The challenge is to ha also have them understand that this is not a solution for small uh, farms, but it also has the potential to expand and, and, and extend to large farms. Um, I was recently in Bolivia a couple of weeks uh, ago, and I met with one of the former students of her program. She is transforming um, his her farm into a factory of bio supplies for farmers in Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia. And she was just telling me it's working for large scale far scale farms. And this is what makes me happy, she was saying. I know we can expand this. I know more farmers, more soybean farmers can uh, use my products and I can expand my business based on that. So uh, a tiny little seed that we planted in the student is becoming a farm of a factory that hopefully in the future will impact many large scale farms in Santa Cruz de la Sierra. So of course we we believe in this practice and the importance and and again the challenges are um, making everyone believe this is not a small solution for small small places. This is also something that should be demanded by consumers of products all over the world and the policies should incorporate uh, promoting these practices more and more. That's a wonderful That's a takeaway um, that we don't, it's not a small solution, but it can be amplified. Um, I just want to give um, Patricio a chance because the last ones were social, social sciences. Patricio, if there was one takeaway that we should have, what would you give one? us as an engineer? <laughs> as, as well, a so essentially what I learned while being there at doctor classes is the, well, showing your fragility when you when you command one specific knowledge type of knowledge and when we deal with the wetlands or whatever type of research you do uh, it's basically doing that and, and moving into uh, difficult boundaries which you commercially do not cross uh, that's what i felt last year in, in a doctor class and I, I guess that these large challenges uh, require this interaction between disciplines and and yeah well we have to move out from the comfort zone, I guess. Wonderful. And I Thank think, you. Um, Do you want to have the last word, Gabrielle? Um, I just want to thank the panelists for a really provocative conversation. I think we could have gone for three hours easily just having, just talking about these topics. And I look forward for many opportunities to both individually and continue this conversation as a whole because the solution small can be applied large, but it also is about leaving interdisciplinary disciplinary comfort zones to be able to find much more complex solutions than the ones we have now. And I'd like to ask everybody to thank the panelists and Gabriela Soto Laviaga. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all thank so much. Thank you all. And sorry we can't invite you to the reception, but those who are in the room. Um, <laughs> we'll do the do when you find it. Yeah. Disfruten Thank las you. empanadas. Yeah. And, uh, yes, yes. Yes. Gracias. Gracias. Chao. Gracias a todos. Gracias. Chao. Muchas gracias. gracias. gracias.